Austin Cook. Hi, Pastor Joel. You've mentioned before that you went to DBU. Do you have thoughts or concerns regarding that institution? What do you think about the current state of Christian higher education? Good question. Thanks, Austin. Um, I have no thoughts about DBU. None whatsoever. I attended the school. I have a degree from the school. Um, I did not live on campus. I never went to chapel. Um, I got a pass uh, for that, so I wasn't just skipping out, but I had permission not to go. I never went to a single chapel with the school. I never went to any of the school events. I had no experience in the campus life whatsoever. I showed up for my classes. I took my classes. Um, I passed my classes, most of them, except I failed art. And uh, and I was like, talked to my art teacher, and I was like, this is insane. This is a, this is a you know a throwaway class, right? You're supposed to just pass people. And she said, I know that, Joel. Um, you are the first student in about 20 years of my art class who's ever failed. So I, you know, I take that as a point of pride. I think that's pretty impressive. I, I am the only student at DBU who failed art class. So I um, had to end up taking it again and pass. But all that being said, my point is uh, I, I don't really know much about the school. I, I really don't. Um, and, and the classes that I took, I didn't, I didn't take a bunch of Bible classes. Um, I took a few, um, but most of the classes that I took were business related. Um, so I can't speak about DBU, but I will answer your, your general question about higher education, Christian higher education. Um, yeah, I think right now it's, it's a uh, slim pickings, right? You got Owen Strand. Um, I forget the name of the seminary that he teaches at grace, something, uh, Grace Covenant or Grace Bible or whatever. Uh, you got Master's Seminary. I personally wouldn't go. I love John MacArthur, appreciate him. I wouldn't go to Master's just because there's enough different, like John MacArthur is a Calvinistic Baptist. He's not a Reformed Baptist, so he's not confessional. He's not Sabbatarian. Um, he uh, is premillennial. He's dispensational, right? So I want something that's going to be covenantal, not dispensational, something that's postmillennial, not premillennial or all millennial. Um, I want something that is Kyperian, a full orbed all of Christ for all of life, uh, not more two kingdom. John MacArthur is not radical two kingdom, but I think he falls more in the two kingdom um, camp than the Kyperian camp. So um, John MacArthur, two kingdom, premillennial, um, also just his hermeneutic. Uh, he despises the analogical or typological Christological aspect of the hermeneutic. Um, that Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians would embrace. So Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians, we would have a historical, grammatical, uh, historical, grammatical, um, uh, literal hermeneutic, but a fourth piece of analogical, uh, meaning we would be able to read certain things in the Old and New, but especially the Old Testament, and see them as typological pointing towards Christ, where MacArthur can do that, but he can only do that when explicitly said or mentioned by an apostle in the New Testament. Uh, whereas we would be able to say the apostles are not just giving us uh, the the exclusive and exhaustive individual cases, uh, but they're actually giving us a hermeneutic, a principle for reading the Old Testament. And so we can look at other passages of Isaiah, for instance, or Ezekiel or Jeremiah that are not cited by the apostles in the New Testament and given their fuller meaning. And yet we can look at these other passages and with careful hermeneutics and careful exegesis say, yeah, this also points towards Christ, or this has a new covenant fulfillment, right? So John MacArthur, I would disagree on his hermeneutic. I would disagree on the fact that he's dispensational not covenantal. Uh, he's non-Sabbatarian. He's non-confessional. Uh, he's uh, uh, premillennial. Um, you know, so there's, you know, he's he's more in the two kingdom camp than the Kyperian camp. Um, so all that being said, it depends where you're at, right? Austin, it depends, you know, um, that being said, John MacArthur is faithful in many regards. Um, and he is, you know, more, more than, more than well, well underneath the banner of orthodoxy. Um, so he is, he is orthodox and, and better than just orthodox. I think he's orthodox and faithful. And I'm grateful for John MacArthur um, in, in a million and one different ways. Um, but I would not go there given my convictions and my understanding of theology and the scripture and how to read the scripture um, and, and also just the need of the hour. Um, I think providentially in the time and place that God has, has put us, I think uh, one of the things that we desperately are in need of is all of Christ for all of life, not just the home and the church, but applying all of Christ for all of life. I, I want to fight. I think Christians should be fighting the culture war. Number one, I think we, we have to wake up and say there is a culture war. And two, um, that that is a part of our Christian mission. Now, that, that's not a substitute. It doesn't overshadow um, um, 
preaching the gospel and evangelism and conversion, uh, but it is a part of the Great Commission. Uh, making disciples, going and baptizing and teaching involves teaching people to live out the gospel and to also live out God's law, his moral law, in every realm of life. And that includes the political sphere, that includes um, culture, the arts, um, academia, uh, medicine, all these different things. And so that's something that, that MacArthur has gotten involved in the court, culture war when it when it encroaches on his doorstep, right? So when Gavin Newsom says, you got to shut down your church, then then John MacArthur will take a, a culture war stand. And I'm incredibly grateful for it and his courage because a lot of guys didn't. Um, but, but I think it's beyond that. I think that we actually need to be infiltrating um, every area of life and bringing the gospel to bear. Um, so all that being said, uh, I think that's the need of the hour. My differences in terms of uh, philosophy of ministry, theology, and hermeneutics um, would make it to where I couldn't go to master's. However, if you could, um, great. If you're dispensational, if you're non-confessional, uh, if you're non-covenantal, you're, um, if you're Premillennial, um, if you have a literal, grammatical, uh, historical hermeneutic, which I do, but you reject the analytical uh, portion, so you would disagree with Sinclair Ferguson, you would disagree with R.C. Sproul, you would disagree with, um, you know, guys like that. Then um, MacArthur, uh, his school, I think, would be great for you. Um, so you could go to MacArthur Seminary. So you got Own Strand and whatever the name of his is. Uh, I forget. You've got MacArthur. There's some other ones that are faithful. I think there's like a John Knox um, seminary that I've heard good things about. So there's a few. Also, you you could go to uh, Doug Wilson and do his grave uh, grave friars um, thing. That's like you know. Now I, I don't know if you'll get in. It's only like I think twelve or maybe twenty guys, but it's just a part of his local church, which I think is one of the best things when you get seminary level training, theological training, um, in the context of the local church. But it's it's still robust and hefty and lots of reading assignments and writing assignments and preaching. And you get to sit in on uh, Christ Church, Doug's church there in Moscow, Idaho, their elders meetings um, and all these different things. And so a lot of guys have done that and gone out of that into formal ministry and been um, just as trained, if not better trained than going to your typical traditional seminary. Um, other than that, though, like right now, the SBC, I, I don't, you know, I don't feel great about Al Mohler Seminary. Um I think Al Mohler says the right things, but he continues to harbor uh, critical race theory professors. Um, and you can just look at the library at, uh, at Southern Seminary and, and find Woke Church on the shelf by Eric Mason and those kinds of things. So, and I think and I mentioned Albert Mohler, not to say that he's the worst, but I think that that would be the best. Danny Aiken would, would be worse. So I think that's the best of the six you know, uh, SBC seminaries. And even that one, I would just be a little bit nervous about. So I would say there's there's a handful of some seminaries that uh, might be worth going to. Um, but uh, that said, I, I think there's so much opportunity today um, by God's grace and in his providence with the internet and all these different things and podcasts. And I mean, you can do Bonson U, right? With Apologia, right? So you can go to Jeff Durbin, James White, you can go to Apologia and they have this for free all of Greg Bonson's teachings. Um, they call it Bonson U, Bonson University. You can take that for free. You can, for $8 a month, you can get the Canon Plus app and uh, just a, a, a plethora of content. Right now I'm going through the, um, it's like a 37 part series by Kenneth Gentry on post-millennialism and it's the recordings, it's super old. <laughs> you, you can tell it's tapes and they have to stop to turn over the tape. Um, but but you can hear what he's saying. It's old, not great quality, but you can you can hear what he's saying. And, uh, and so it's super old, but it's his seminary class. It's like a 37 part seminary class and that I'm getting uh, for $8 a month um, by doing Canon Plus and a whole bunch of other stuff too. You can get courses in economics by um, by Greg Bonson's son, David Bonson on the Canon Plus app. So I just think that between, you know, the Moscow guys, between Apologia, between our ministry, between, you know, other, other faithful ministries, there's just enough content that you can get. Yes, there are some things that you probably... Well, you can get these too, but you just probably won't do. Here, here's what seminary does. Seminary, in some sense, it forces you to, uh, to learn things that you would not want to learn um, on your own, like languages. Some guys want to learn that, but typically guys are much more uh, interested in systematic theology and biblical theology than they are Greek and Hebrew, myself included. Um, so I'm weaker, personally. I'll, I'll admit that I am weaker on languages than I probably would be if I had spent years and years in, in uh, seminary. 
uh, but I am stronger than a lot of seminary graduates that I know um, in other areas um, that because of their seminary and some of their compromise in that seminary, uh, they didn't give them a full orbed theology on blank, you know, this or that. So all that being said, it depends on you. It depends on the gifts that God's given you. How, how disciplined are you? Um, all those kinds of things. Um, but assuming that you're disciplined and you're motivated and you want to be in ministry and you want to be in ministry faithfully able to teach um, with, with experience and knowledge, um, if you have that desire and you have that discipline, I think you can, you can learn without going to seminary um, or you could go to uh, a few of the good ones. Uh, but by and large, the days of, oh, well, let's just go to this seminary and you know, pretty much any Baptist seminary or any Presbyterian, we, we can trust them. Um, I think those days are gone. The last thing I'll say, bringing it full circle all the way back to our, our question about Baptist polity um, and you know, who has authority within the 1689 Reformed Baptist you know, church polity for, um, for administering the Lord's Supper, or baptism, or preaching, or teaching. Um, that's one of the beauties of being Reformed Baptist. So I don't know what you are, um, but uh, I'm Reformed Baptist. And if you are Reformed Baptist, ordination, uh, the institute... Um, that, that has the authority to ordain ministers of the gospel, elders and deacons within Reformed Baptist theology. Uh, church polity is the local church. It is the common suffrage, is the language used in the 1689, meaning it's the majority vote of the members of that church. Um, so that's, I, I, again, I think that's one uh, strength Right, and I, I understand. On the other side of the coin, you can make that out to be a weakness. Like, oh well, you're going to have a bunch of Baptist preachers that aren't theologically sound because they never got a formal education. Um, that's possible. Yeah, you could have um, you could have some uneducated Baptist preachers, but you could also have some highly educated, formally educated, but compromised Presbyterian preachers. And I think we've seen that. Right. So in the Baptist world, you've got. Guys, you know, who don't have a degree and, uh, and they do some things that are bad, like Stephen Furtick is in the Baptist world, technically. Um, on the Presbyterian side, uh, you've got Amy Bird, you know, you've got uh, Tim Keller, highly educated, but he's a Marxist, straight up, right? So you can have the highly theologically trained Marxist, or you can have um, the Baptist who's faithful, but it's like, gosh, I, I wish he... I wish he knew a little bit more, you know, and obviously these are extremes. You can, in both worlds, you can be highly trained Presbyterian and faithful, and you can be a Baptist and not dumb. You know, you can be an educated, you know, and, and trained Baptist. Um, my point is just to say that within the, the, the actual Baptist confession, within Reformed Baptist polity, um, you don't have to go to seminary um, to be uh, a minister of the gospel, to be an elder. And to be fair, on the Presbyterian side, um, this wouldn't work in the PCA, it wouldn't work in the OPC, but um, if you're a part of Doug Wilson, uh, his um, pres presbytery, uh, the CREC, um, they don't require that someone go to seminary because if they did, then Doug Wilson uh, would not be qualified. Doug Wilson did not go to seminary and he knows far more and is far more faithful than most people who have gone to seminary. And so his, his presbytery has recognized, okay, that's an extra biblical requirement. Bible doesn't say thou shalt go to seminary. What the Bible does say is you must be able to teach. It doesn't say how you get there. That's the point. The Bible says, here's the benchmark, um, but it doesn't say, and the only way to get there is with this curriculum and this syllabus and these professors and this piece of paper giving you, you know, your credentials. Sem seminaries like to pretend as though that's in the Bible, uh, but it's not. The Bible says you must be able to teach, which means you must be diligent to learn. And the reality is, um, in our day and age, there are more and more avenues to learn and to learn well if you're disciplined and if you have that desire without uh, taking a loan and without giving your money to a seminary that you find out, you know, halfway through your degree is woke. Okay, so that's my answer. Wait, 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 real quick before you go, do me a favor, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell so you'll be notified with all our new content as it comes out on a daily basis. And if you're willing to support this ministry, you can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate. Thanks so much. God bless.